This idea, I've recently come across this idea, if you want, if you are a reader, if you want to do some, this is not like, by no means do I think that you should have this for CPN, but it is an incredibly interesting book. Uh, the book of why, by Judea Pull. Now, um, so I'm reading this book and I came across this idea of causal diagrams, which I think is an excellent way of uh, describing the way that variables relate to one another in this causal chain. Uh, so up to now, you've heard me speak of this causal chain um, with words like, is there a satisfying answer to what makes that happen? Um, the nomenclature or the, the, the wording that Judea uses uh, is, does variable X uh, listen to variable Y? <clears throat> then let's say we have our classic tank system, right? And so uh, we have if in, and we have V, and we have if out, and maybe we also want to say there's a couple of other symbols that we would like to have in our model. And so by now you should be able to uh, write down the equations describing the system almost from memory since we've analyzed the system so many times. It's, it's kind of the stock system for uh, kind of mass balance type systems. But I'd like to place these variables or these symbols into a diagram that explains how they are related to one another in a causal way. So with the diagram that I've drawn here, um, we're first going to identify which things are universally constant, and so those things are the parameters. And I'm just going to highlight that over here and say, right, so A is a parameter, A uh, doesn't change. Obviously, parameters are deaf in the um, Judeo pool terminology, right? They can't listen to anything. Yes? So what if the tank was a conical flask? Uh, oh, a conical shape. If it had a different shape. Uh, yeah, then wouldn't A then be also be a... Uh, Output? Correct. Yes, but but so for the purposes that we're working with here, we're working with a with a um, with a tank that has a constant uh, area, and you can imagine uh, it's a good diversion because it shows you that there are few hard and fast memorization roles that you can kind of memorize. That you can say, oh well, I know that when I'm dealing with tanks, the surface area of the tank is always an, a parameter. You know that's a thing that is only true given that it is of constant surface, of constant cross-sectional diameter, right? So many tanks are spherical or conical or cylindrical. You know if they're lying on their side, and all of those things would not have this property. So it's important to identify those things up front. And I, I want to I want to have you understand that the diagram that I'm going to draw now, which is the causal diagram. Um, is something that you cannot infer, as I've said many times, from the simple physics of the problem. So you can't write down the balance equations and from the balance equations infer this causal diagram. But it does help to formalize your thinking. And so it's not groundbreaking. It's really just a uh, what is called a directed graph, which is dots connected by arrows. I'm going to draw the variables inside, inside of circles. You can, you can label. Uh, dots as well. There's not really a, a hard and fast rule about these things. And now we start saying what variables respond to the change of f in in the most direct way. And so we can say that both v and h, right, are in some sense causally connected to f in. Now for physical systems like these, it does become a little bit difficult to distinguish between the direction between does the volume cause the level or does the level cause the volume. I would argue that those things change simultaneously uh, governed by the algebraic equation that describes the geometry of the tank. And so I would extend uh, Dr. Pull's uh, notation slightly to include groups of variables that are uh, interrelated. And so here we cannot establish a clear causality. 
So it would be incorrect to say that the level changes because the volume changes, or that the volume changes because the level changes. I would say simply that both the level and the volume are connected together um, in an algebraic relation. And we could choose uh, either way. Yes? Would that be similar to saying that they're both just different ways of expressing the same thing? Correct. You know, so I haven't drawn an arrow on the line connecting over there um, since uh, they are interrelated like this. Then uh, we have the relationship that governs F out. And if we're talking about our, the, the standard uh, system, we know that it is the variables that describe the geometry of the tank, or effectively the geometry of the tank, uh, relates to just that there is a clear direction connecting F in, where F in has no incoming arrows. And the others, where they have some incoming arrows. And once we draw a diagram like this, the naming of the inputs becomes very easy because we can now very clearly say that inputs are nodes on the causal graph that have no incoming arrows, that are not connected upstream to any incoming arrows. Now, I want to show you, now this is under the assumption that, um, which I will call the the normal assumption, which is like the rate-limited uh, tank where we have some extra equation here that says F out is equal to K times H or whatever, right? Now, there's a couple of interesting things that become a lot clearer when we draw a diagram like this. For, for one, it becomes clear what I've been trying to communicate when I, uh, so, sorry, that's actually F out, uh, when I have encouraged you to uh, order your equations or write your equations in such a way so that the output is on the left and the inputs are to the right. Because now we can see that, for instance, as F out is some combination of things uh, in that geometry, I would uh, be able to write that relationship as F out is equal to a function of, and then just list all the incoming arrows. Does that make sense? And so, This is kind of the text version of that uh, graphical drawing, right? Um, now, I have, I have implied here that there is this kind of relationship that relates the amount of substance in the tank to the tank itself. But as we saw in Tuesday's TUT problem, this is not always the case. And I, I, I am trying really hard to... Uh, not just urge, urge you to generalize, uh, not to generalize or to uh, specify your models eagerly, but I'm trying to uh, take the approach of actively trying to name counterexamples, right? So in this case, you may be tempted to say, well, I've done so many of these things where always F out is equal to KH. I will mentally, even though Carl said, don't make this a general rule, it's happened. I've never seen a counterexample, so I'm just going to like generalize to that rule. I'm going to give you a counterexample now, which is exactly the same, which has the exact same variables. But I would like you just to imagine the drawing to be slightly different, and I would like you to imagine. Yes. Um, would the F out not also have a back causal nature on the H because our, any, our mass balance has F out also influencing the rate of change in H? <coughs> Say, say, um, if, if, if in words you fall uh, Yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you, and uh, that doesn't change, it doesn't change the, so it is true that if we, if we had the full set of equations, we could have something that's not directed. So we could indicate that with an arrow on the graph, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and it still does not change the categorization of the variables. Uh, so please note, I'm not introducing like a full formalism here, I'm trying to give you a, a, uh, an easy mental model of how to think of these things. Um, so, so, you know, just like full disclaimer, like I, they, this isn't based on, so um, Judeo's pull's uh, models are strictly causal, so they have, no, um, they have no feedback loops, so they assume that there is a pure causal chain. Obviously, when we're talking about physics, these simultaneous things do happen, and there's probably a lot more work to be done to draw diagrams that are completely rigorous. Um, I'd just like to have a picture in your mind, right? So I'm not going for a full rule. 
the most important thing that I want you to get out of this is that's kind of the picture that I have in mind every time I talk about the causal chain. So if I say, oh, the inputs are the things at the head of the causal chain, this is what I mean. I mean that there are variables that listen to other variables, and they can be drawn as nodes with arrows going into them, and there are variables that don't listen to other variables, that, that are kind of, uh, they just are because they come from some outside. And uh, another important idea is if you, had a, if you had some kind of objection saying, well, Cole, if in doesn't just happen, right? Like something makes if in happen. The, the answer to that interesting puzzle is that we draw a system boundary. And in that same way, I can basically say that inputs are variables that only have arrows that come from outside the system boundary on the causal diagram. Now, I want you to be very careful when you think about these arrows because a common but wrong shortcut that students use to imagine what causality is, is to look at the mechanical diagram <coughs> and to say, but look, I can see, and, and you, this is why I'm going to build a counter example now, because you may be generalizing this wrong. You may be saying, oh, I understand what Carl says. Here's an arrow that comes into the system, so that's definitely an input. Here's an arrow that goes out of the system, so that's definitely an output. I'm going to break that for you now. Okay, so imagine that you are designing a water distribution system. All of you have seen water towers, right? So a water tower is one of these. And now just for simplicity, imagine that we have exactly the same kind of system with a constant surface area and so on, but that it is standing on a tall platform. Right? And... <clears throat> Water is pumped into this platform from some kind of a reservoir, and this is called F in. And uh, here I am. I am the very poorly drawn man who is trying to uh, fill a bath. Okay? You have to squint really hard, but that's me standing next to my bath. I've just opened the tap. Okay, and does everybody agree that the water distribution network going from wherever that big water reservoir is to my house, imagine that I'm the only person in the world, I'm sure that it's possible for everybody to, uh, we all have a little bit of solipsist in us, um, so imagine you're the only person in the world, this whole system exists only to service your needs, you've, you've, you've just opened that tap, and uh, now you make the uh, water flow to your house, get more. And so from the point of view of the water distribution network, right, and I'm going to draw the boundaries in such a way so that all the same variables are there, okay? So there's still a V, there's still a H, there's still a F out. Do you understand that from the point of view of the water distribution network, F out is an input now? Right? If I was operating that water distribution network, I could only see, I, I have no control over when you want to draw a bath, right? I could see, hey, Carl's drawing a bath, the water's coming out now, and oh, oh, he's finished now, so now he's closing it. From my point of view, I just see more water going out and less water going out, and it's completely outside my control. That is being made to happen by an outside force, which means that in this case, F out is on the start of that causal chain, right? And in fact, actually, the, I would say the correct version of this is that both F in and F out are inputs in this system. Is this making sense to everybody? No. Okay, where am I losing somebody? Okay, so, so let's just walk through the causes again, okay? There's this big water tower. Big water tower is connected to the tap in my house. Imagine that's the whole world, right? There's no other people using water, just me. Okay, so when I open the tap, water comes out. When I don't open the tap, water doesn't come out. I try, I have a goal, right? I have a flow goal. 
I make the flow. I decide what flow to have. I can decide whether I make the tap full open or, you know, everybody's had this experience. The water pressure seems high today, so I open the tap. Wow, that's coming out really fast. Let me close that a little bit because I don't want it to go out that fast, right? So I choose, the man in the house chooses the flow that comes into his house, right? But understand that that is the same flow that comes out of the tank. It's not the tank deciding what the flow must be. The tank can't decide what flow must be because the guy in the house is making that decision. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay. Has this broken your picture? Notice, flow coming out of the system boundary, not an output. Making sense? Why? Who's deciding? Who's calling the shots? The man. Where is the man? Outside the system boundary. Okay? So it's not, there's no variable inside the system that says what if out is going to be. The man says what if out is going to be. And the man is outside the system boundary. And so from the point of view of the system, that is an input. Yes? This is something that uh, it confuses me slightly with this. If the volume was zero, if there were no water, if, if in was zero and B was zero, if out couldn't be anything greater than zero. Yes. So it is somewhat caused by what's happening inside the system as well. Yes, there are physical constraints. Okay. So another version of that is that the man couldn't ask for a negative flow, for instance. Yes. Right? There's no, there's no easy way to push water back to the water tower in the system. Okay? Um, and I mean, that's an important insight, but you have to kind of understand the, the framing. This is why I use so many words and why I cannot simply draw a diagram. Because these questions have to be answered. Right? If I just draw the diagram, you could imagine me connecting a very strong pump in my, you know, but, but I'm telling you that's not happening. Why? Because I'm saying this is a normal situation. It's a man drawing a bath. Right? So you have to have a very extraordinary imagination to imagine a situation where a man drawing a bath causes water to go back to the water tower. While it's physically possible, we're, we're, but, I mean, it, it's funny, but I want you to understand this point. We are explicitly choosing to limit what our model can model. Okay, every time we write down modeling equations, every time we make a decision about the causality, we are placing limits on what is possible for our model to handle. And the sad reality is the only way to build like a completely legit model of the world is to really incorporate every single element of the world. And we will always decide to limit our models in some way. And those assumptions and limitations are some of the most important parts of what makes up the model. Now, I'm sketching that situation because the same picture, the same variables, I'll get to you now. So uh, the same picture, the same variables with a different story, a different story like maybe that is a pumping station and it's connected to a river and there's a pump that pumps up into the, that completely changes the whole model, right? All the same variables, all the same pictures, right? It looks even like because I'm, I'm such a terrible sketcher, right? Like I could even convince you that that is a pump instead of a, a, a bath, and, right? So it's only the words that allow you to understand what the limitations on the model is, okay? But question. Okay, so if you were to put a limitation that the level of your tank has to remain constant, would your FN then be an output because now you're affecting the system by changing F out, but to ensure that the system remains at constant height, would F have to You'd have to spend a lot of additional words, right? And like in, you'd have to explain how that was going to happen. Yeah. So, so when I drew this diagram, I didn't say anything like that. Yeah. Right? I just said, look, it's the same situation. There's a tank. It's filled with water. right? And, and remember, even if I had a controller, even if I had something, so, so there's a couple of ways in which I could make that happen. So this is by not that big a stretch of an imagination, very similar to the cistern in your toilet. And the way that that keeps its level approximately constant is by having a float and a valve and so on. And then the, when the float floats down, it opens a valve. Now, in that case, if I drew the system boundary to not include that mechanism, 
the flow rate would still, that flow rate that coming, that's coming from that ball mechanism is still an input into the system. Does that make sense? So these are the key points. We have to be very clear and explicit about the system boundary. And in most of the sketches and diagrams that I draw, um, I draw the system which is within the system boundary. So it's implied that the picture that you are seeing is everything inside the system boundary and there are no other parts. There may be parts that are discussed, but they lie outside the, di the, the system boundary. So I think maybe as an as a, uh, aid to thinking about it and probably a good communication aid, it's probably a good idea when you draw a sketch to indicate clearly if you are showing elements that are not maybe described or uh, part of your model to show clearly where the system boundary is. I believe that this causal diagram makes it super easy to identify the inputs, right? Because now we can very clearly say, okay, everything that is at the start, this is what I mean by causal chain. And please notice that it's not only one thing, there can be simultaneous effects. In other words, both F out and F in affect the amount of stuff in the tank. And they are independent inputs. They don't talk to one another. There's no special coordination between the man in the house and the man at the pump room, right? Even if there were somebody trying to keep that level constant, that decision-making process, remember, lecture number one, we exclude for the purposes of this subject the decision-making process from the analysis. And so even something like there is a man watching the, watching the tank and trying to keep it constant, or there is a machine you know, connected to the tank and trying to keep it constant, or there is a mechanism like a ball float that floats on the level of the tank and tries to keep it constant. If those decision-making processes are left out, we end up with the same causality diagrams. 